Welcome. I'm going to talk today about um, several things. I'm going to talk about the use of Unix text tools, which is mainly what this presentation was designed to um, show and illustrate. But I'm also going to talk about regular expressions. And uh, although regular expressions began and were first implemented in Unix systems, they are widely implemented in other systems these days. And with ver SAS version 9, um, they are widely implemented, available to all SAS programmers. So, <coughs> excuse me, let's, let's begin. Our picture of a sheep might seem a bit strange, but what we are going to be doing is exactly what this guy is up to. Selecting what he needs, um, the wool is actually attached to something else. And so although he wants to harvest the wool, he has to separate it and treat it and eventually turn it into cloth. And uh, this is the, the fundamental process we look at here, how to split things apart, separate them, put them back in new orders. And Unix text tools were designed for exactly this kind of issue. So we'll, we'll look in this talk about what commands are available and what problems we can use to solve with them. Uh, with some relevant examples for SAS programmers, how you can actually put them together to solve your problems that I don't discuss here, and uh, regular expressions. We'll start slow and work up, and hopefully you'll, by the end of this time, by the end of the talk, you'll have seen enough practical, interesting examples to understand how you maybe can use regular expressions in your own work. Uh, one does quite a lot of text analysis and reading these days with SAS, but really um, reading variables in and then using SAS uh, text functions, although it works, is tricky. It's tricky and very detailed. The, the wonderful thing about regular expressions is it's much easier to program something that is directly like what you want to do in uh, fewer steps and therefore this makes programming complicated things much much easier. Of course using Unix text tools is not exactly the same as SAS programming but of course it's my belief anyway that learning a new way to think about problems and how to solve problems is actually going to help your SAS programming It's going and it's going to help your problem solving and thinking in general and so this I believe makes a very interesting subject for all SAS programmers, even the ones that are not using Unix. Uh, incidentally, actually, all these Unix tools are now available in um, XP, uh, free from Microsoft. And these days, with PowerShell, um, a lot of these techniques are also available. OK, so let's begin. Oh, I should mention that all these examples in here come from my everyday work as a SAS programmer programming um, safety tables and such like and I've found them directly useful and I hope they're going to help you. Now when you have problems like this the great thing about these regular expression tools and the Unix tools is that you can build something up modular in a modular way step by step getting closer and closer to what you need and as always um, it's up to you to decide when to stop and when you might not need any more and uh, how close is good enough. And the great power of these tools is that because they're simple, the commands are relatively straightforward, it's easy to patch them together in new and different ways, it's often possible to solve a, a programming problem directly um, with these tools. Now, of course, they're general tools, so you might say they're not going to be efficient or fast, and that's perhaps true. We'll look at some timing information later. But the thing is that most of the problems that we tackle are often one-off problems. They're short, one-off problems that we need to solve today and we probably won't need to solve tomorrow or the day after. And therefore, a tool where you spend three hours programming a solution is not very useful for these kind of problems because it doesn't repay the investment. So Unix text tools take an opposite approach to programming. They, 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 do, they each do something and you're able to combine them in a, in a um, flexible way 
And this is a different approach to programming that lets you get straight into a problem, get a quick solution out in maybe 10 minutes of programming. And that's a whole different application area from what you might use for a SAS program. And for that reason, they're also very, very useful to learn. And so they complement the SAS skills that you have. And um, yeah, well, we'll see this. I mean, you may or may not be convinced, but you can uh, make your own decision about that. Okay, so just some, um, it's sometimes difficult to get these long command lines into the slides, and I've uh, put a greater than character at the start of lines that are commands. So lines with that character you, you would type in without the greater than, um, and other lines that you see there will be uh, lines of output from the system. Um, if you're using a different shell from the one I use, you might have a different prompt character. You can, in any case, with shells, always reset that, but uh, it's just a matter of note. Okay. So these, as I said, are for quick solutions for problems where writing a long program in SAS or any other language is not worth it. Um, but it also allows you to practice regular expressions in a simple text environment where it's very easy to see um, if your regular expression is giving you the right answer. If you're programming with a regular expression inside SAS, it's a lot harder to see um, where it's going wrong. And um, so this is a very good way of training up your skills. Uh, you should notice there are some di slight differences in the different syntaxes of regular expressions, but the main stuff works. So anyway, beware of that. Okay, Unix text commands, what do they do? Well, if we take our orange square as a data file, we have a whole group of commands that just work on the whole file and do something. So TR, for example, translates characters and iconv does the same thing. iconv actually covers uh, Unicode characters and lots of machine dependent uh, date, uh, data formats. WC counts words and expand changes tabs to spaces, cat copies the, the program somewhere, um, and T and split and sort. Split and sort uh, will split a, split a file horizontally as it were, um, and sort will effectively give you the original file you had, but in a different order. So the next group of commands actually select out particular rows, what we might call observations coming from SAS, and these are com, join, unique, and grep. Bolded commands, incidentally, are the more common ones you are more likely to use, and of which we'll see more examples of. So then we have a group of commands in the third box with the vertical blue stripes. Here we're cutting out variables, what we would call variables in a SAS context. Cut minus C, cut minus F, cut working by character number, and cut F working by fields and you have to define what defines a field. Col RM is similar to cut minus C. So then there are also commands that can do both of these or combine these operations at the same time. And these get more like programming languages. SED is the, is the simplest perhaps, and ORC and um, shell languages, Perl and Ruby, are progressively getting more complicated and more powerful. Although ORC is perhaps it is a programming language and is designed exactly for remunging data and spitting it out in different forms. So it's very good for processing things like CSV files, for example. But we'll see examples of these later. I'm not, in this talk, going to cover the corn shell, Perl or Ruby. Uh, these are talks, these are subjects for another day. Well, how do they f fit together? The thing is that Unix commands can be put together in long sequences separated by vertical bars, which are called pipes. This syntax is also available in some other uh, operating system command shells, such as DOS. However, the Unix implementation is, uh, shall we say, better, for want of a, a shorter word. Um, it's very consistent, I would like to say. So the way this works is that the output of one command automatically is hooked up by the system to become the input of the next command. And uh, the 
power of this is that you can, of course, replicate this by using um, temporary files. You run one command, save the output to a temporary file, reading the temporary file with the next command and so on. But piping um, is actually more efficient because the files can be read and written to at the same time. So they, they use the system resources very efficiently. But um, also it's simpler for the programmer because there's no deciding what the, pro the temporary files are going to be called, no remembering to the re remove them, etc., etc. So this is programming, although it in a sense is using command operations in the operating system. And we'll see what I mean. Oh, they these text files commands do run fast. I've got some timings later and um, we'll get back to that, but don't think they are going to be a slow option. For many, many problems, they, they work good enough for an everyday solution. Okay, regular expressions are wild, wild cards. You're probably all familiar with the wildcard star.sass and uh, this means every file name with some characters at the beginning that are a legal file name and dot sass at the end of it and it works in exactly the same way but there are different rules from the file matching that you may be used to and actually these different rules make it quite difficult for most beginners to get something out of their early commands so i've got some hints and tips to remember so normally um, we can control an action with the uh, regular expression but we can also uh, extract the exact match text as well and there'll be some examples later on of why that's useful. So the confusion points I wanted to mention dot in a regular expression is the equivalent of star in a file name matching that means any character that is any character except end of line in fact and so for example labl star dot sass would match labll z sass LABL dot star backslash sass is not matched. Now, this is because um, dot has got a special s status in Unix shells because it's it's used, it's allowed in a file name, but at the beginning it means hidden. Elsewhere, it does not have a, st a special status like it does in DOS. So if you want to match a file type, you only have to have sass at the end of the file name. If we want to match an actual dot character in a um, in a file name uh, in a regular expression, then we have to escape the dot and use a backslash, because dot of course means any character. Okay. But the good news is that typically with a with a regular expression, you'll be you'll have much less coding uh, than. Is tip, you would typically need if you were going to do the same kind of extraction with SAS character functions and you don't have problems with extra trailing spaces and all kinds of stuff like that. So one of the first rules is if there's no match that's silence. So in other words if there's no match you get nothing back. In other words when it's matched you get some text back. So of course the problem is that it could be missing in other words, um, you could have uh, got a typing error in your regular expression, and that means that you don't get your text back. Um, so it's, you have to, because of that, proofread your regular expressions very carefully, or uh, what I recommend is test them on some data files where you put in values which you know will match, and you know some which you know should not match, and so on. And then this enables you to do things carefully. So let's have a look at the uh, syntax. Patterns are applied line by line. So that means when you get to a line in character, the rule is only for one line. It's very difficult with regular expressions to match patterns that are across, um, across line ends. So it's not a good idea for matching text, where if you want to look for Dave Garbutt, um, for example, if Dave was at the end of the line and Garbutt was at the beginning, then you would never find a match for it. So it's that's a little bit of a, uh, a limitation. There are ways to get around that, but uh, let's not look at, talk about that now. <coughs> so 
um, expressions have all these components. Characters, underlined in blue, those are real literal characters. So ABC, for example, in, the, in their regular expression line. We have ranges of characters. Ranges of characters are enclosed in square brackets. And um, they, they are like A, B, C, for example, means A or B or C. If we had written A minus B, that would have meant A to C. Um, sorry, A minus C. That would have meant A to C, not um, A minus and C. OK, we also allow to have alternatives. And that's the green bracketed expression. So we can have, for example, big vertical bar, small. And that means big or small. Then numbers of repetitions are allowed. And uh, that's the syntax for that is a, a pair of curly braces with the, the smallest number of repeats and the largest number of repeats that is allowed. Then there are escapes. And this is the backslash. And so the backslash underscore in that line above means an underscore character. So all the characters that are used in regular expressions like plus, minus, square brackets, um, and so on, these are um, uh, these you can get into your regular expression with an escape character with a with a backslash first. And often the problem with a matching um, uh, a regular expression not matching is because the escape something has not been escaped. So it is either searching for the wrong thing or uh, an inappropriate thing that isn't matched in the data. The, the last category are anchors, and there's just two characters for that. The um, up, the tilde, um, not, excuse me, the hat character, which means the beginning of the, the line, and the dollar character, which means the end of the line. So here we're looking for the characters A, B, C, with um, one A, B, or C, followed by an underscore, then a big or a small, and then the word present repeated two or three times. And the line must only consist of that. If you don't have anchors in there, then the match will be taken anywhere in the line. OK. So here's some simple examples. The top one here matches um, a, a SAS variable identifier. In other words, it must begin with a, a letter or an underscore. And then after the letter or an underscore, it must have letter, underscore, or a digit. And then uh, subsequently, it can only be seven characters, maximum uh, eight characters long. And because we have one pattern matched at the beginning, um, we, we need a naught to seven repeats of the first. So naught repeat means we have one letter in our variable name. And uh, seven repeats would mean we would have seven uh, characters in there. And then here we have uh, a pattern to match um, the file names of SAS catalogs and data sets. They're similar sign names, something followed by SAS 7B dat or SAS 7B cat. So the only difference in those two names is the C and the D. So here we have an alternative, C or D at. And although regular expressions can seem very simple when as you get used to them you find that this is actually a much more uh, precise way to specify things so the string population matches the string population anywhere on the line exactly those letters in exactly that sequence so uh, let's have a look through some SAS logs um, your, your famous colleague programmer, the rock star programmer, Wiley T. Programmer, has left some logs because he's dashed off home and your boss thinks there may be issues and they hadn't even finished printing yet. So let's have a look for an error. Grep, this is the command that looks for a, a string, a fixed string in a file. So that um, would find any errors in comments or in, uh, elsewhere in your program or where you've printed out this is not an error, for example. So we can um, refine this a bit by using minus E, uh, option of grep, which gives us an, uh, allows us to use a regular expression in our string. And then we have beginning of the line, then the error in up, uppercase and a colon. So this is 
more like a real error. And then we have maybe in some errors there are actually spaces between the, the R and the semicolon. So there may be unlimited number of spaces. There can be zero or none, um, zero or more than one. So this third expression will give us an even more refined look at catching what the errors are. And then, of course, in some places, we might have used the convention that we print out our programming errors with lowercase. So if we want to catch those as well, which actually it turns out Wiley T Programmer has done because he wants to look at them and not uh, have them detected by the standard detector, we can put E in upper or lowercase. And one way to do that is to exp express in each place the uppercase or the lowercase alternative. This, of course, allows us to have mixed case error, words error, which are not natural, but never mind. It's only extra matches. There's a simpler way to do that. There's an option of grep, which allows you to ignore case. And so that uh, number five does the same as number four with a lot less typing. But you had to do a bit more manual reading. On the whole, manual reading is a great thing to do. And uh, when you get frustrated by typing long, complicated things in regular expressions, I can recommend it. Uh, well, we've successfully been testing with one file. Now we fire it. Now we've got a working expression. We can fire it up and run it on all of the log files in that directory. But there's no output. Why is that? That means there's no errors. So we can tell our boss, yep, that's fast. They're all OK. No errors. And it's 7.18 now. And we're out the door. And what we did now was we programmed a solution. We had a, a one-off problem. We programmed a one-off solution. All we did was type type lines. Each of those lines we edited from the previous version of the line. So the actual number of characters we typed is very little. So of course at this point I can imagine people are worrying, well, do I have to learn all of these commands before I can get anything done at all? Uh, to these Unix is well known for having hundreds of different versions. Uh, do they work on all kinds of Unix? I'm using Windows. This is a waste of time. Won't this take a long time? My log files take 500 KB. And this stuff looks like Chinese. How can I ever understand that? Well, these are all worries, but um, I think I can show how this we can we can miss this stuff. So um, we'll look at now at some detailed examples. They're a bit hard to show well in PowerPoint because the long lines that we end up with often don't fit very well on the on the page. But you can go and look at the text version of this paper, which has a bit more readable lines in it. And also you can copy and paste the stuff from there. Um, you can print this uh, slide deck with the note pages. and. Um, you can also see them online at this URL, where I have a tiddly wiki that has got um, all of these examples in and more. And you can, that, that's probably the best place to go if you want copy, copy and pasteable code. OK, so let's have um, a look at um, some real life examples now. Can I see who's got access to my studies? Yeah, of course, because um, this is recorded in Unix in the, um, in the groups. And the ls group commands tell you who is in your group. Um, so if we check the group membership, we get the answer. It's not very easy to read, though, uh, especially if um, there's 200 people in your group. So if we just want to list the users, we can get a bit more, uh, get a bit more fussy and use the minus a option and get minus a users for my proj and just get a list like this. This is. All very well but it would be nice to have a list on separate lines and uh, remembering that the octal for a line feed code is backslash 012 we can tr use translate to translate the commas into line ends and then delete the first line and we use sed to do that uh, 1d means for line one do a delete and then for every other line don't do a delete so we can pipe that together first we list the users as we did before 
and then we pipe that into translate and that tr translate command says translate comma into line end so it's from to and then pipe the result into scd scd delete the first line that you get and then we pipe it into sort so we get everyone in alphabetical order and that gives us that list here and that's much more readable now also be possible to save that in a file watch how it changes every week these kind of things okay so um, all text files are not equal and so a common problem is that we have our Unix file copied from Windows perhaps placed on a, a Unix um, directory using Samba and then when you use it in, in, in Unix you get strange messages and the, the reason underlying this is that text files actually are not the same on every platform although they look the same Windows uses two characters to mark the end of line Unix uses only one character to mark the end of line and this um, the two characters Windows use one of them is the same the last one is the same control L and the first one control M is uh, a legal character in a Unix file name actually and so this causes all sorts of problems and there are various ways to um, fix this so if we we can translate um, we can use the translate command again and delete uh, octal 15 and that's what this command does translate minus d to, for delete octal 15 input file from reading from input file and writing to a clean file and then we can uh, rename we can rename the clean file as the input file and so we don't have to uh, we can check it first make sure we didn't clobber anything else how can I see just the lines with um, a particular flag for example error the files 10,000 lines we want to select rows that got once the pattern number space and a flag character I'm thinking of lab values now so a flag character here is something like H high low medium and in our actual listing file we might have a line like at the bottom uh, week 64 um, 404 hash 465 hash those are high values so the flag this grep command does that grep minus e 0 to 9 at least the digit followed by an unknown number of spaces followed by one of the characters hash dollar um, hat and um, plus and it must have one of those characters at least because otherwise it's an unflagged number so this means a numeric without a decimal point and uh, with a flag marked on it and if we apply that to the lab listing then all the the, all the lab listing files then the output that we get is like this so it tells us first of all which file name it is and um, gives us the week actually and then we can from that find where the where the thing is now the use of this is that if you are changing the, the rules for um, for flagging for example or checking that the right values have got the flags and all the flags um, are applied in the correct way or that the units have been converted correctly this will tell you exactly because you have a list there of all the flagged values so this is very uh, very useful thing when you're working on that program so did you remember to rerun the format program before you ran all the all the all the outputs again because you had to recreate the formats ah good question so in this case uh, we can what we can do is look at all of the formats all the format programs look at the date that we've got for the SAS program and then have a look at um, when the format program was done so LS minus L Bob this study report and then we look at data or PGM or maybe SAF formats but anyway formats and then it has to be a SAS or a SAS 7B cat And then we get a list back of in through all those directories because you can use these uh, wildcards file wildcards inside directory uh, paths as well as within file names strictly 
You can also do this with what are called compound shell commands. And there you have a look at, you run the format SAS program. And then if, if, the, um, if it's newer than, then you print run the program. So the, the square brackets surround make it into a logical test, meaning the command is evaluated as a true false expression. And NT is true if the left hand file is newer than the right hand. And ampersand ampersand means if the command is true, the second command is run, else it's not. So this is quite a neat way to get a, a conditional message. Well, let's say we want to run every SAS program in a directory. First, we can generate a list of the programs, and then we can pass this list to a command to execute each file. So we can do this like this. Apply is a command that takes a quoted argument and repeats it from the list that you give it in the rest of the line. And uh, so SAS minus no terminal minus no OVP percent one and percent sets off a background job for SAS in the background on each star.sas program in the file. And then uh, if we put that ampersand at the end, instead of where we had it in line one, then we run it sequentially. The first one kicks off a job for every SAS program at the same time. And you might or might not want to do that. Most likely your administrator doesn't want you to do it even if you want to do it. So, and then the last line um, shows you another way to do that, which is to tell, give SAS a large number of file names. Now, this is different. This has a different effect. And the reason is that in this instance, you run it in one SAS environment. So if one of those programs fails, it'll turn the data, the error on, and then the rest will get skipped and you'll get a really enormous log. So this also actually might be what you want to do because you might not. If one of the programs, for example, compiles the format and fails, then you don't want to maybe run all of them. So this is uh, another way to, to accomplish the same means or almost the same means. So this ampersand means run in the background, as I say here. Um, compare this loop instantly to what you might write in a SAS macro or base SAS. It's just an implied loop. It says pass these things in and just redo it. It's, there's no, you don't have to know how many SAS files there are. If there's a hundred or a thousand, it's still going to work. If there's none, it's still going to work. So you have less programming to do in a sense. So assuming we've done that, you might want to check um, if, you've, if it's really created a log for each program, maybe some of the, the SAS files were not readable and they had the wrong permissions, for example. Uh, we could do this by checking if there's a log for every program. So if we say ls star dot sas word count, how many lines, then we'll see there's 200. And if we do the same for the log files, then we see there's 200 log files. So there's presumably one for each. But what if there are some old ones? So let's have a look at the dates of the listings. And if they're not all today, then we have a problem, obviously. So we can use the ls command to get a list of files and the information about them. And that includes the date that they were created. And um, so the first command here, ls minus l star dot sas, shows the, the sample output you might get from that. And uh, in blue is the date information. Now, what we need to do now is just get the date information and then somehow treat it together. So we can do that with um, the ls command and these extra arguments to suppress the headers and so on, uh, sort in time order. And then we can do a cut command. And with the cut command, we can cut out column 38 to 49. And that just gives us a list of the dates. So if um, today was the 18th of April, then we know that, OK, we've modified one SAS program today and the others previously. And if we were looking at the log files, we would be able to see if all the log files were dated today or not. So this is what I mean when I'm saying um, these are little tasks which um, are not big enough to warrant writing a whole system for, 
but uh, when you're using things every day, they're very, very useful indeed. Well, let's extend this idea anyway and have a look at creating a histogram of the file dates so that we can count how many files were modified on each date in the current directory. So first of all, we extract the date for each file, then we account the occurrences for each date, ignoring the times, and print the result table neatly. Okay, so ls minus l minus big H minus T is, gives us all the files because we haven't given it a wildcard. Yeah, with date details, no header, and sorted by time. And then we pipe that into SED. So we delete the first line, which is the total number of files, as it happens. And then we cut out the columns 44 to 51, which is where the date is. And actually, of course, they moved to the beginning of the line. And then we, um, then we run the unique command. And the unique command takes out the duplicates. So it just tells us which different dates there are. But the unique minus C command counts how many duplicates there are, and it puts the count at the beginning of the line. So we can see the output here. We've added in this, in this case, actually a sort to sort by the date for the separate fields so it comes out in a more reasonable order. Um, yeah, sort's a little bit messy, but useful. Okay, so here we have three done on the 7th of March, three done on the 6th of December and one done on the 7th of April, for example. So this is um, very useful because you can now find out if some of your programs ran, but their logs were not updated. In other words, they didn't, haven't been run, rerun since they were changed. By adjusting the order of the sort, you can have a histogram within year, month, or day. This one is a histogram sorted by the first field, which is the frequency of the count. That's all very well, but sometimes we want to do things um, like, given some lab listings we've created, usually there's a whole set of lab listings, as I'm sure you know. Um, here we have uh, a convention that the country name is followed by a slash, followed by the sent name number, followed by the patient number. Now, that actually is quite a, a unique kind of pattern for a string. So. Um, what we can do is we can get the list of patient IDs from a lab listing by going through each lab listing and pulling out all the cases where we have a match to that pattern. Three words of text, a, new, a slash, a number, and a slash. So all we have to do then is count how many there are of each, of each one. So this uses the sequence that we've seen several times already. Select what we want, sort what we want, and deduplicate. WC counts lines, and with a minus S, um, we need one patient ID per line. So we need a regular expression for the patient ID. And this will do it. So A to Z, upper or lower case must be there, so that's followed by a plus, and then a slash, followed by a number. We're not going to say it has to be three here, it could be any number, but there has to be at least one, and another slash with any characters in the, um, in the patient ID. And then we look through that um, listing, and then we use the head command, pipe it into the head command. And the head command is very useful because it tests, it allows you to print just the top ten lines. So it's a great test tool. You can run the command, uh, make sure the beginning of it is OK, and then when it's working and doing what you want, run it with maybe 20 lines or 100 lines or uh, 3,000. OK, so this is OK, but um, we're getting the whole line. And so our unique isn't going to work here, because with the whole line, um, with the rest of the data on the line being different, uh, obviously, we won't be able to count how many patient ones there are. So um, let's take out the first field, and we can do this with awk or with cut. So extracting from the lab listing, taking the first field. Awk, this is the simplest program, awk maybe you'll ever, you'll, you'll start with anyway. So awk, quote, curly bracket, print, dollar one, curly bracket. So the bit in the curly bracket is um, 
the program, the action that has to be done, and the condition is not mentioned, which means just do this on every line. And dollar uh, one is the field, the first field. This is a bit like um, an ampersand variable in SAS. So now we can take our previous command and pass it, pipe it now in extra into org, print one, and also into head. And now we get a list with just the um, only the patient ID. But we have duplicates, of course. So that isn't a list of just the patient IDs. And so then what we can do is add a sort, pipe into unique, and then do a head. Uh, just take the first three lines, because we know there's three patients, and that will give us the same list there. So now what we can do is we can count how many lines there are. Um, and that will tell us, and to do that, we add a WC minus L at the end of the pipe. So grep from the list file, orc to get the first field, sort the whole thing, delete the duplicated lines, and then print count how many lines there are, and that gives us 200. That's the number of patient IDs that there are in there. Now, we should probably know how many patients there are. We probably somewhere have got a list of what the patient populations are. And so this is a useful kind of a test to be able to do because it's actually looking at what is in the lab file that you have created. So it's not checking what's in the database. It's not checking what, what you've done in your program. It's checking actually what is there in the results file. So uh, of course, this will work no matter what your output system is, as long as you're using the same convention for naming the patients. Uh, a test base like this is going to give you the, right, the same answer. So this is a very useful second direction to come at validating and, and cross-checking your data and your, your outputs before you let them out to people. So if we put in a wildcard, we can scan all the lab files. In this case, we want to scan all the lab files that have got uh, lab L1 underscore 2 and then one single character. So then we can, um, again, adding a, a patient ID, um, then add another sort unique uh, sequence, then we can get this output. Well, we get this program. And what that does is it then will count how many patients there are in each of the different listings files we have. So in, in the 21, 22, and 23 lab listings, we have 200 patients. And in 24, we have eight. And it turns out that eight is the one that has the is the labs for the patients with serious AEs. So we would expect it not to be the same number. But the others, the 21, 22, and 23, are all based on the same target population. So they must have the same number of patients in, and they do. So we know that now, no doubt about that. And this, as you can imagine, it is a lot faster than reading through. Uh, 10,000 line files and counting how many patients there are. Well, of course, I said there might be um, pop different populations there. And of course, there is a population identifier that identifies in the lab listing which population is used. In the header, it says extension safety population, or it says safety population, or high risk population, and so on and so on. And so we can have a look through all of the listing files now, 21 up to 1 up to 9, and uh, we can look for the word population. And then, again, sort and unique, and just print out the first five uh, for this slide. And then we see those are the populations in those particular files. So we now know that there are, as long as there's the same number of patients in the extension safety and the safety population, then our previous counts of 200 are okay. But if we ex had expected those to be different, we now think there's a problem. But 24, as it turned out, was a high risk population, not the uh, adverse events, serious adverse events but it's a different population and somewhere we would have a table where we can also cross-check that number. Or you might think we could write this number too. Extension safety population. So, <clears throat> so of course, um, can we match this up with the patient counts? 
well, we should be able to do that, shouldn't we? So if we count the, um, the files first, this um, gives us there a file 200. Um, if we output that information into um, the file count, then we can look at the populations and we can uh, get a file, a text file. Sorry, I'll start again. Let's, let's put this together with the numbers on the counts. So what we do now is we create a two, pipe, two different pipes which actually do use temporary files. So we put the counts for the files on a file by file basis into file count.txt. We put the, the populations into another file which is the file name dot, um, and then followed by the name of the uh, population. And then using the the join command, we can create one listing, which is a join of those two things. So here we are joining on the first from the first file, the second field, and from the second file, the first field, the two files, filecount.txt and labpops.txt. And when we do that, we get this output here. Now this is pretty neat because although it's conceptually a simple join to make, the, the mechanics of writing a SAS program to do that are fairly complicated. So we might end up with like 20, 30 lines by the time we've created all that stuff. And here we have a very straightforward solution. So this join command and the other commands that operate on whole files at a time, these are actually very powerful. Well, can we extend this a little bit further? Yes, we'd like to count how many patients there are in each treatment in each output file we have. Now, how would we know that? Well, we know that because in each, um, in each page, there's a header that says what treatment that patient belongs to. So we can count the, count the, um, the remember the text for the, for the treatment and then count the patients that are under that treatment. So again, we can do a two level summary using two sort and unique uh, sequences. Well, now we're gonna use a Gork program uh, because what we need to do is um, in the output of the uh, lab program, we wanna remember which treatment is the current one where we, when we record the patient number, because the thing is that we don't know actually. So what this does is it records uh, this Gork program records the treatment and it records, uh, it stores the variable and then uh, it, it uh, sets the variable TRT to dollar zero, which is the, um, the argument, the command, the whole of the line. So then uh, it matches that pattern. Then it looks for a pattern which is our familiar pattern that represents a patient number and it prints and then if it finds a patient number, it prints the file name and then the treatment that we have, and then a dollar one. And uh, <clears throat> it puts that out into the pipe. And then in the pipe, we do a sort unique, and then we use another org program to just pull out the two fields that we want. And then another unique with a count, and then another org um, to uh, count the counts. Yeah, this sounds a bit hairy, but actually, if you set the example up and follow through it, it's a straightforward extension. And this is the way, of course, with straightforward extensions, um, they get more and more complicated. And so if you come first look at them, they don't look straightforward at all. But this is the nice, this is why this pattern of programming, this piping concept works so beautifully, because you can build something very complex up, taking one step at a time until you have something which is uh, very close to doing exactly what you want or even doing exactly what you want. So if we run that program, which as I said, these programs are in the paper or on the website I mentioned, where you can copy and paste them, you can try this for yourself on your own data. So here we have um, 35 patients, 87 and 78 in the first listing and then different counts in 24 because that's the uh, ones at risk and so on and different counts again in 25 because it's a different population and um, of course these could be um, uh, they could be patients that were 
had no lab data, for example. So, uh, we're getting near the end of producing all our programs. Everything is almost running, but um, we need to check all the titles are exactly what are specified in our in our study um, study guide. And of course, this is a bit tedious because you have to go and open every file, look at it, compare it very carefully to what uh, what is in the program. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could just list the titles out, and then have um, even when there's different numbers of title lines in each output? Well, some versions of GREP have got the paragraph option minus p, and that will so help us solve this problem very easily. I said before, remember that. Um, the regular expressions end at the end of the line. So a regular expression is not a good way to do this. Uh, you can probably find the title, the top line of a title in a listing, but then how do you say, I want the next three lines as well? Well, this minus P option does that. And uh, so if there's a text that's on every first page uh, where there's a title, then you can get it something like this. Say maybe the text is page one of uh, that only is going to happen once per listing, and so we can run that through every listing, but for each uh, listing file we'll get a paragraph out, which is all the titles. So we can also uh, set the field separator to line end and stuff, and the org program has got the two clauses where we want to feed it into. Incidentally, I'm using Gork mainly here. That's because the uh, error messages are better. And there are some extensions. I'm not using any of the extensions in, in these programs, but I recommend in using Gork if you have. So this enables us to pull out page one of, print the file name, uh, which is a, a, a variable that's available in the Gork program, with the whole of that paragraph. Some of these longer outputs um, I don't have in the slides, but you can go and check the paper and see that see how the details work. And of course you can run these on your own uh, logs and listings. Okay, so what about getting um, issues that reappear? In other words, we do a programming fix and then things come back and start going wrong again. So what we could do is for every listing we do, when we do a run, we could save, um, say the first page of every, um, every output, save it all in one big file, and then we could date stamp that file name. And then the next time we do a run, we can save the first pages again. And then we could use a diff command to find out what has changed and make sure that the stuff that has changed is the stuff we've fixed, only the stuff we've fixed. And uh, things that we haven't fixed uh, have not changed. So this is a Gawk program that does that. Uh, begin is uh, a clause of the program that's done at the beginning of the um, beginning of the, as it starts processing the file and then uh, that program ends in the curly bracket so begin set, set the field separator to um, end of line that means we get a pull in a, a whole clause and then we can uh, set the record separator to a line end and that will give us um, uh, give us the all the top all the header lines page one off print file name zero and then put that to the list. So to save the first, that'll give us the whole top first pages for each file. Uh, if we wanted to save save the uh, first three pages or four pages, we can change the expression in page one of um, to, uh, to page one to two or page one to nine of, and then we would have a bigger chunk of each file. This might be useful later on in the study when um, some of the data perhaps are not um, some of the data where you get issues not happening on the first pages. So um, with our massive outputs, we're going to check our RTF files. Um, and our RTF files, you have to open them all and have a look in them. But actually, it turns out that RTF files are text files, in fact. And of course, when I first thought of looking directly in my RTF files, I thought, well, this is difficult because you have to write a a program to parse the RTF file and find out what you need. Um, but then, actually, inside an RTF file, there's extra markup, but the text that you have is still the text that you had anyway. In other words, page one of n is still page one of n. And um, 
a patient, the, the format for the patient identifier is still there. So you can scan, as it turns out, with Unix text tools, RTF files. And as long as you write your regular expressions carefully, then you can just seek, get the lines where the text matches. And then if you pull out the uh, appropriate pieces from the lines using Gork and the field separators, then you will have um, very easily actually a scan doing exactly the same things that we've done with listings. So this is uh, quite a long org program now, and it assumes the date um, the file was written is in a line containing the file program path, which is just an output convention. So at the bottom of each page, it says something like report, um, study, etc., and then it has maybe tier one or tier two. And then on that line, there's a date, and that's the file write date. So we need to find the lines where there's a date. Um, obviously, we don't want any date because there could be data mentioned inside lab listings. And then we extract the date from that line. And that's done using the Gork match function. Uh, this is similar to the, um, the, match, um, the matching expressions that are used now in SAS 9. And then what that does is it returns one if it's found a matching string. And then it puts location into system variables that you can plug into the substring function to get the date into a variable. So if we found the date on a line, the program prints the file and the date. And this is the this is the Gork program. And it looks horrific, but it's actually very simple. It's it's a little bit like using first dot and last dot programming in SAS because when first dot and last dot match, then you do something. And this is actually how Gork programs work. When a particular condition matches, then you do something. And so when the condition here is that there's a line that contains report and then a slash, uh, and that has to be escaped, of course, hence the backslash and then a slash. So that's all that, that that first part of the program says. And then the four lines for semicolons are just a four line program to pull out the date string. And actually, when you think of what that's doing, that's pretty cool because that is pretty fast, pretty easy to write. First, get the, get the match, match it, then uh, get this, pull out the part of the file name that's the, um, uh, the beginning and the end, uh, where, the file match, where, the, where the report name is, and then pull out the string. And if it's OK, meaning if we found a match, then only then print the date and the file name. And off you go. And then, of course, we apply that to all of the RTF files. And then we sort it using uh, uh, space as a separator. And then we're unique. And then we have our list. So one more thing. What, why, when we're doing checks like this on our outputs, we're measuring what is actually in the deliverable, not what's in the program, what was in our first version, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the power of this kind of um, approach because it makes no assumptions about what's in the data sets, what format the data sets are in, um, if they're version nine or version six, for example, or about what the variable names are that we're interested in. Because, but um, they can also be applied to more than one kind of reporting system. So if you have your own homegrown reporting system, and then you also use um, a different reporting system for some kinds of reports, or maybe there is reports coming as RTF files from uh, outside suppliers, it doesn't matter. These, these checks can be scripted and run automatically, and they will work on any of the text files. And as I said, text includes RTF files. So this all adds up to a uniquely powerful way to tackle output validation and testing. Uh, because it's not keyed in to the tools that you use to create the outputs. So it's independent of that. Of course, it's not independent of your data formats and, and your conventions about what you have on the lines and so on. But in any given clinical program, you'll probably find that those change less than the suppliers, the reports or the reporting system. Well, we have a visual summary. We maybe should have had the visual summary at the beginning. So. To start, we have some very worried looking sheep. They know something is up, something is going to happen. And sure enough, they've been piped into a guy who's dragging them off into the place where they're going to be sheared. 
And here we are, we've sheared off in the next step of the pipe half of the data we want, half of the wool we want. And then we have a nice bundle of wool and then that's all packed up. And then we can turn it into cloth and knit it and turn it into some wonderful, wonderful Fair Isle jumpers. Okay, so our conclusions. Knit your own. It's a very great way to get skills in Unix and um, skills that are complementary to your SAS skills, but nowadays with regular expressions being very, um, very prominent in SAS version 9, it's actually um, also helping you learn SAS um, regular expressions too, but in an interactive uh, play-as-you-go environment, which is much more forgiving and easier to uh, fix mistakes in than in a, in a more programming environment. Um, I didn't mention hashed arrays, but actually Gork supports hashed arrays, that is to say arrays that are indexed by character string. And uh, this makes it very, very simple to do things like simple histograms and stuff. It's just trivially simple. So um, it's also a very, very fast way um, to do that. Uh, so you might uh, find lots of uh, uses for that. And once you've used hashed arrays and got you cut your teeth on them in Gork, you can go on to use them also in SAS version 9, where they are also very fast and very well implemented and very easy to use. I hope you found it can also be fun. I mean, we all like sharing sheep, right? So, um, as I said, there's the website TiddlySpot um, where you can set up a tiddly wiki like I did. And the tiddly wiki that I've got with um, this content in it, with these programs where you Easily you can cut and paste them because the quotes will be in the right format, unlike maybe in the Word document. Um, I hope you enjoy these techniques and uh, go on to use them. I'll say that although I did this talk now four, five years ago, um, I think it's just as relevant now as it was then. And it is perhaps actually more relevant now that uh, regular expressions in SAS 9 are so readily available and so well implemented. Really it's time to say goodbye to complicated uh, text processing using character functions. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope to hear, hope you'll be tuning in for some of the other um, upcoming FoosTube um, talks that I'll be doing. And um, yeah, have a lovely day. Um, sadly, you can't ask me any questions, but the quote is useful. I think it is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that they seem difficult. And I, for me, this is, expresses exactly my uh, approach to regular expressions. I put off learning them for several years. And when I did finally do it, I was very cross with myself for not doing it earlier. So, yeah, enjoy yourselves and um, do lots of regular expressioning. Oh, um, my current address is not as on the screen here. My current address is david.garbert at biop.ch, B-I-O-P dot C-H.